Hi. All right. Thank you very much for this super kind introduction. It's a, yeah, an absolutely pleasure to be here today for many reasons. Uh, yeah, I, as uh, Boris mentioned, I did my PhD at Dow and started about 10 years ago. So time do flies. And yeah, it's really good to kind of come back, even if uh, virtually. So, um, so hi, everyone. I'm Mauricio Cantor, and I'm a biologist by training. But since I started uh, at Dow, I consider myself as a behavior ecologist by passion. And through my interactions with the folks at uh, White Hat Lab and other grad students and others in the department, I kind of got into this because I realized I'm really puzzled by why things do what they do and the way they do and why they keep doing that. So another way to put this, I usually don't understand behavior and that's why I really like to study. And behavior is important not only because uh, already famously said before, it's everything that we do from the moment we're born all the way to the moment we die. Not only this, but everything that we do has an impact on something else, so we interact. We interact with uh, our peers, we interact with uh, the environment and with other species. And those interactions have consequences. And I'm really interested in trying to measure these consequences for the individuals, for their populations, communities, and ecosystems. So today I'll try and give you an example of this. And it's an example that matters a lot for me, not only because I kind of grew up surrounded by it and hearing these stories, but I want to try and make the case this is also uh, matters for you too, because I think it illustrates um, how the behavior that we humans uh, choose can make a positive impact on a diverse uh, natural world around us. So let's start with some good news. And I'm sure people at Dalhousie know this very well. Uh, nature is still diverse. And for as long as there has been natural history buffs around, there has been fascination for this kind of diversity. And at any scale that we look at, the ecosystems or habitats, the species of individuals, the life forms and the strategies that we find, there's, they're dynamic and they are diverse. And when humans interact with this diverse nature, the consequences are bound to be profound and they're rarely beneficial for both parties. Usually humans uh, gain most of the benefit and nature pays the higher cost. So throughout history, our human ability to learn how to interact with nature has been key to our global ecological success, but also to a global ecological crisis. And the escalating human wildlife conflicts are no news to anyone here. And these conflicts, they contrast sharply with the very few cultural practices that benefit both humans and animals. And today, most historical cases of human wildlife cooperation, they are in decline or already gone. So understanding the conditions under which uh, human wildlife interactions can flip between beneficial and antagonistic is critical if you are to align human interests with uh, wildlife protection. But this is a challenging endeavor because it requires impacting how the environment and behavioral factors interact to shape the benefits the individuals receive. And this can be more complicated on a, a rapidly changing world. So here we would like to talk about one of such systems, the cooperation between artisanal fishers and modern orthodoxies to understand how those interactions take place among individuals. And then second, we'll um, zoom out to, to, so first we'll zoom in to understand the, the mechanics of this human wildlife interaction. And second, we will zoom out to infer the consequences of these interactions to the resilience of the system, the social ecological systems that they are part of. Okay, so this story takes place in southern Brazil, where uh, wild bottlenose dolphins interact with artisanal net casting fishers to access the same resource, primarily mother fish. So dolphins will herd the fish towards the coast, where the fishers stand and wait for uh, the specific cues that they interpret as the right time to cast their net. And then, in turn, dolphins will equal a case to go after this year. Oh, like it's clicking the way. Right. 
So this is an intriguing system because the ecological interaction they're taking place among these two top predators uh, from different environments, they seem to be stable over the last 140 years, and they seem to be socially transmitted across generations. And while the key participants are only three, the bigger picture is still rich. So for example, we need to understand, we need to know the distribution of the prey in space and time, how many fish is there, uh, how, uh, how is the abundance affected by environmental conditions. On the fisher side, we need to know how they synchronize the behavior with the dolphins and how that synchrony affects their fishing success. And finally, for the dolphins, we need to understand the benefits that they gain by interacting with humans and how the existence of these kinds of interactions impact their population dynamics. So to try and tap into these questions, we use this uh, multi-platform tracking system uh, to try and sample the environment and the ecological interactions among those three species simultaneously above and underwater. So for example, we use uh, sonar cameras to quantify the fish in, under that murky water. We track uh, dolphins with drones and fishers with GPS bands to quantify their spatial behavior and also their coordination. We photograph dolphins and interview fishers to find out uh, who is who and who socializes with whom. And then we record the dolphin echolocation and observe the fishers at the beach to quantify their rewards for interacting. So our first step is understanding how uh, environmental conditions influence the prey that in turn shapes the propensity for these predators to interact. The abundance of mullet, which are migratory, uh, is likely to be influenced by both regional and uh, local uh, environmental conditions. So in the sounder winter, um, the mullet migrate along the coast of Argentina and Brazil, and when conditions are suitable, they enter estuaries and lagoons, like our study site here in Laguna, to feed and grow. So the first step is to estimate how many fish is available for fishers and dolphins to catch. But doing this is more uh, difficult than it might seem because most of the time the water is super murky, like you can see here. And yeah, it's impossible to see where the fish schools are. So to solve this problem, we deploy this high resolution sonar imaging system, which basically uh, like an ultrasound for, for pregnancy tests, it projects like, uh, acoustic energy to generate dig digital images. And then from this kind of top-down view of what's going on underwater, uh, we have you know, lots of hours of sonar videos, and then we process, uh, process these videos as sonograms. And then we can relate the presence of the fish with the environmental conditions that are known to influence that uh, mullet migration. For example, wind speed and direction, uh, tide state and velocity, water temperature, transparency, and things like this. Then from the uh, sonar imaging uh, data, it revealed that there are better and worse in local environmental conditions for the presence of mullet fish at the interaction site. For example, the schools of uh, migra migratory mullets are 35% more likely to be detected at that interaction site in warmer days during uh, low uh, flood tide. So now next, uh, in the absence of dolphins, we, we noticed that the fishers, they tend to follow the same environmental cues to go, to go fish. But the few fishers that try their luck by themselves, here represented in, in the y-axis, they tend to go fish in, in, the high, in these higher conditions of um, high environmental conditions of uh, high fish suitability, mullet suitability, and the, and the X axis. But the fishers that follow the dolphins more closely, uh, they tend to follow the dolphins more closely because uh, than the environment, because they know that without the dolphins catching any fish is very unlikely. So here we have in the uh, Y axis, the total number of fish caught by, by fishers in the absence of dolphins. And the X axis, we have that mullet suitability, the environmental conditions for which we can predict when the fish is there. So we can see that, you know, regardless of the fish suitability, they catch pretty much nothing except for that one lucky fisher here that got about 10 fish once, but every, everybody else know this is a losing battle. But then by putting GPS bands on the fishers, uh, we can time uh, their movements in and out of the water in the presence and absence of dolphins. 
And we can see that they respond very strongly to the presence of dolphins and much more than they do to the environmental cues. So we can see in this map here, we're showing the bottom the beach where they wait and here the, the line where they, yeah, the water and where they line up to interact with the dolphins. And yeah, they spend much more time in the water when dolphins are present. And uh, when the dolphins arrive, they tend to run. Here's an example of one individual that kind of run from, from the beach to the water as soon as the dolphins uh, arrived. And we can see there's a, yeah, there's a good correlation between the number of fishers in, willing to interact with the number of dolphins foraging in the area. But the key detail here is, um, is not only the sheer presence of dolphins uh, that uh, is important for this interaction. It can attract the fishers, but it does not impact uh, the fishers' success. There's more to it. So to now to investigate the effects of dolphin and fishers on each other's uh, foraging success, we quantify their behavior synchrony and success in four different cases. So the first one is the typical synchronous interaction, the one that I showed in the video before. So the dolphins will approach, make a behavior cue that the fishers interpret as the right moment to cast their nets. Then we have three types of asynchronous interactions. So, for example, when dolphins approach, make a cue, but fishers cast their net at the wrong time or wrong place, too late, for example, or yeah, too far away from the dolphin. And then there's other two uh, cases of mismatched actions. So either dolphins don't make a cue, but fishers cast their nets, or the other way around. The dolphins uh, make a cue, but fishers don't cast. So we compare those uh, how, how they vary in this fine scale synchrony and how much they gain in each of those kind of four pseudo treatments, if you want. So I keep seeing uh, behavior cue. So what is a dolphin cue? So a dolphin cue is this uh, stereotypical dolphin behavior that prompts the fisher to react to castor nets. And the most common one is this distinct sudden deep dive that they do arching their back right in front of the fishers. Uh, and the local fishers call like the dolphin is, is jumping in front of me. So from this kind of uh, fine behavior data, we can start looking what the dolphins are doing to the fishers foraging. So the sonar imaging again reveals what the dolphins are doing to the, to the fishers foraging. So here we have in this kind of colorful graph that will come, we have in the y axis uh, the mullet detections in the sonar, so the intensity of uh, fish that we detect in the sonar. And then the y axis, we have the time relative to the interaction here represented in a dashed line, so two minutes before, two minutes after. And we have the synchronous interaction compared to all those three asynchronous interactions. So what we're seeing here is uh, during the synchronous interactions, there's a high increase in mullet detection uh, after more or less after the, the dolphin cue. And in contrast, we don't see such a pattern in any of those types of uh, asynchronous interactions. So that migratory mullet schools, when they're passing through the canal, they're out of reach for the net for these net casting fishes. But with dolphins actively herding the fish towards the coast where the fishes are, just before giving, giving a cue, so they turn that area into a temporary high quality uh, patch. And again, we don't see this happening on, and our model suggests that they don't happen with, uh, during those asynchronous interactions. And then by sitting at the beach, it's easy to quantify how much uh, the fishers get out of this. We can count, measure, weight their catch. And the message is pretty clear. First, net casting is a hard business. They usually don't get too much out of this, but they, they do catch much more when the dolphins act in synchrony uh, with them. So the mullet caught by the fishers come primarily from those synchronous interactions with dolphins. And this is almost, almost independently of the conditions for the, uh, the environmental conditions for the mullet suitability. So what we're seeing here in the y-axis is the total number of fish caught by the fishers. In the x-axis, we have the environmental conditions that in indicate the, the probability of uh, mullets being detected in the air. So yeah, during the synchronous interactions, again, when dolphins act and the fishers react in the right time, they catch much more fish and you know, almost independently of how much fish is there. And we don't see again, any of those and those asynchronous interactions, they pretty much don't catch anything. Um, so uh, 
this suggests that when dolphins and fishers act in synchrony, uh, dolphins can increase uh, the fishery's success by more than 10 times. And this leads us to the obvious question. Yeah, what is in there for the dolphin then? So the hypothesis uh, that the dolphins are getting pretty much the same benefits from interacting with humans, so more fish. But measuring the uh, dolphins foraging success is much trickier uh, because we rarely see, again, where the mullet is under that murky water and uh, how much the actual individual fish the dolphins are catching. Uh, this is where the real work starts, I would say. And to do this, we now use the same trick of trying to see with sounds that we did before with the sonar to count fish. But this time we rely on the dolphins' own sonar to find out when in time and how much they invest into uh, foraging. I'm sure you all know this, but dolphins echolocate. They emit these small pulses of sound and interpret the echoes once they bounce into something. And they use these clicks to scan the environment and navigate and also to locate prey. Um, for example, in this study where they, uh, they were able to put a camera and a hydrophone on a dolphin's head, they show very clearly that they produce fewer clicks, fewer of those echolocation clicks as they're navigating and scanning the environment. And once they're homing on prey, they will increase the, the rate of these clicks into what they call a terminal bus. Uh, so this indicates that they're actively foraging. It might not be prescriptive if they caught fish or not, but it's the, the way I see is the equivalent of a dolphin casting it, its net. So it's uh, yeah, really trying to go for it. So by measuring then this interclick intervals and controlling for how many dolphins are in the area and all of this, we can um, use some machine learning techniques to distinguish and tease apart these different echolocation processes and evaluate when in time dolphins invest in this terminal bus. So this is what we did with the uh, recordings uh, before and after each interaction. So again, one or more of those colorful graphs we have now on the y-axis, the number of terminal bus clicks that dolphins uh, have done, um, and in the uh, uh, x-axis, we have the time before and after of the interaction represented by the, the dashed line. So what we can see again is a similar picture that we, we got on the Fisher side. So we, we see an increase in the number of terminal bus clicks after the interaction. And our models predict that you know, it, can, it, inc it definitely increased, but we don't see that uh, the same pattern in any of those asynchronous interactions. So the key point is when dolphins give the cue, fishers react in time, dolphins will also go after the prey. But if they give the cue and the fishers either don't cast their nets or uh, cast too late, then the dolphins won't bother to invest in this very active uh, echolocation processes. So again, it's not prescriptive of the dolphins catching fish, but if they're doing this consistently and over and over again, um, and waiting, and, and, and we show that there's a little lag here of about 10 to 15 seconds, which matches really well with the time it takes for the net to hit the water and sink and close over the fish. So if they're doing that reaction to the net consistently, it's a, then a good indication that the dolphins might be getting something out of this whole business. And one of the things that surprises us from this study is from that underwater um, image that we used to quantify the fish. Eventually, at some point, we saw a few interactions uh, with the dolphin interacting with the net. Um, I'll, soon I'll quickly walk you through this video. It might be staggered for you. But uh, the, the previous hypothesis that we have is uh, that about what the nets or what the fishers are doing to the to the uh, oops, to the dolphin uh, success is uh, they're disrupting the mullet school. So a uh, uh, tight coordinate mullet school is a textbook example of defense against predators. So if the nets disrupt that structure either by trapping the fish or breaking it apart or removing most of the fish, that will facilitate the catch by the dolphins because the dolphins really need to go after one fish at a time. So we, we would expect that the net will disrupt it by uh, uh, the, the, the mullet, but we hadn't expected to see the dolphins really interacting with the net. 
So what you seeing here in this video, and again, remind, as I said before, it, it, sound, it, it looks like one of those pregnancy tests. And just like those pregnancy tests, I think it's much easier for the parents to understand what's happening than from everybody else. So we'll try and walk you through this. So first, what we see, again, this, pro this provides you a top-down view of uh, the underwater image. So here you have this round thing is the net hitting the water and the dolphin approaching underwater here. And the second point uh, here in this case, there's maybe just one or two mullet trapped in the fish. And that moment of the very active moment with uh, lots of shuffling around the bottom indicates that the dolphins are going after the fish. And eventually, when we count the fishers' uh, catch, we can see evidence of dolphins, you know, biting some of, some of them. <clears throat> All right, so this that was the first part. Uh, we to sum this up. Uh, so the availability of prey that is influenced by the environment and also by dolphins pushing them towards the coast, and then the fishers' dolphins' actions and successes are highly depend uh, dependent on each other. Now, this very close look to this interaction review two key features. So the first one is the behavior synchrony between the predators is really key for both of them to gain short-term benefits. But then when we put this into a longer perspective, it also review um, lots of variation across all the actors, all the components of the system. So by looking now uh, in more uh, long-term data over the past 15 years, uh, we show that there's variation in the quality of the individual players, individual predators, and that also variation in the quantity of the resource that underpins their interaction. So as part uh, of, of this uh, research, we've been doing interviews with the fishers to quantify the behavior. And it's clear that some are very experienced and perform much better than others. And uh, we also been using uh, drone data to quantify how they position uh, relative to the dolphins, you know, how they vary in terms of how fast, uh, how fast they can react, uh, how distant they can uh, cast their nets and you know, how nicely and wide open they can cast. So there's quite a lot of variation among the fishers. And there's also similar variation among the dolphins. So individual dolphins, for example, show up at different times different uh, conditions at that interaction site, some at a high mullet suitability, others not so much. And um, some interact much better with the fishers than others and are better at herding fish towards the coast. And the fishers themselves for a long time have recognized this and they distinguish and call them, you know, the good cooperative dolphins versus the lazy one that kind of show up but don't do much and the bad dolphins, the ones, the non-cooperative ones, the, the ones that never bother to approach. So the not so good news on this uh, variation is the variation in prey availability. So by using um, data from the uh, local small scale and industrial fisheries, we, we have some early signs of potential decline in the availability of mullet in southern Brazil. So these variations in predator skills and the prey abundance, they're important because that's where the resilience of these little cooperative system relies on. Behavior variation can uh, translate into a lack of synchrony between the dolphin's actions, the fish's reactions, therefore lowering their uh, combined success. And this can only get worse if the fish is indeed uh, declining. So like in any, any cooperation, the persistence of this uh, interaction will depend on the payoffs that individuals receive and declining payoffs by making individuals or predators in this case to abandon this tactic. And indeed, as both the dolphins and fishers undergo a high population turnover with seeing fewer cooperative individuals in, in their population and also a population level decrease in the frequency of their interaction with net casting fishes. And again, this will only get worse if there's fewer fish for them to catch. So the question that we're after is how long could this interaction persist? And can we anticipate any tipping point in the direction payoffs to then prevent the dolphins and fishers to abandon this uh, traditional foraging or fishing practice. But before getting into that, I try and answer this question. Let me just uh, explain why we should care about this. Well, this cooperative fishing, it really matters for the dolphins. 
And cooperating with the net casting fishers increased the survival probability of dolphins. And we showed that those good and lazy cooperative dolphins, they have 13% uh, increase in survival probability compared to the no cooperative dolphin. And this uh, tactic also used to shape their social lives into distinct social communities, which now has been uh, dismantled by you know, the decreasing of this interaction. This interaction also matters for this humble fishing community because dolphins generate food and good income. It also provides other ecosystem services such as leisure and cultural pride and a sense of belonging. And you can see in these photos, the fishers are very connected to the dolphins uh, and their connections go way long, you know, beyond business. Now, to the payoffs for this cooperation to reduce, then, you know, everybody has to search for alternatives. And an obvious uh, alternative for a fisher is to keep fishing, but changing strategy, changing gears. And the problem here is that few fishing gears are less impactful as uh, these artisanal net casting. As an alternative, fishers can increase the game by trawling for shrimp or placing long drift nets to catch other, other species such as uh, catfish. But this tactic needs to be used in a larger area, much larger than the area where they interact with the dolphins, here represented by the yellow dots and in blue shades, the home range of the cooperative dolphins. The alternative for the dolphins, like any other dolphin in the world, is just go forage by themselves. But this will also mean that they'll have to increase their foraging areas as the non-cooperative dolphins do. And you can see that these changes imply in high cost uh, for both species because their conflicting interests now overlapped. And it's a, uh, problematic because drift nets are locally illegal and drift nets are harmful. Drift nets are now one of the main causes of mortality and this um, dolphin, this local dolphin population through bycatch. And then if everybody changes this strategy, the question in reactor is when will that mutually beneficial interaction flip into a mutually harmful one? So to project this and try and come up with uh, some possible answers for this question, we now combine the empirical data uh, that we collect over the years with numerical models to uh, simulate some scenarios. So a place to start is like using what we learned from the system and try and predict what happened. So we developed these models that um, change in the way, you know, provide different scenarios for uh, the mullet stock and how that affects the, the frequency of interactions between dolphin and fishers and how that interaction affects the dolphin uh, population dynamic, uh, dynamics, for example, survival rates and recruitments and changing in strategies. And then finally, what the dolphins are doing, how does that change in the engagement of the net casting fishers? And then we project how changes in the system can shape the trajectory of the dolphin population. So the worst case scenario is the mullet stock crashes, the dolphins are quick to abandon their net casting and, and this can promote uh, more drift nettings drift netting, which uh, doubles the bycatch. We also simulate the current scenario where things are declining, but more slowly, linearly. And finally, the best case scenario where everything remains steady over time. The resulting uh, dolphin population trajectory over the next 100 years are quite different in these cases. The best case scenario, it will reach a carrying capacity. Everybody's happy. Now, should the mullets keep declining as they are currently, then the cooperative dolphins might be buffered from, from the bycatch, but the bycatch will be especially hard on the non-cooperative dolphins because they range over larger areas and have a higher probability of being caught. Now, should the mullet stock crash, then it's bad news for everyone. Cooperative and non-cooperative cooperative dolphins would be by caught more often, and the cooperation with fishers is predicted to be extincted in the next uh, decades. So the lesson here is changing behavior can introduce many negative interactions in this uh, ecological system. It can turn traditional fishers into environmental outlaws, if you will. It can increase the mortality of dolphins through bycatch and then can promote the overexploitation of the local ecosystem. But overall, it means that the system can flip so that once a stable and uh, cooperative system can flip from a positive interaction to a negative, a competitive one. 
And then is there anything that we can do to reverse this error? Well, we can try and start locally uh, because reversing the mullet stock crash will take immense economical and political changes. We can try and reverse the fisher's behavior, which is still very difficult, delicate, and yeah, hard to do, but it might be more manageable. So now on top of those worst case scenarios of the mullet stock, we will uh, simulate two local actions. Um, so one is uh, this top-down action of increasing, uh, investing in more uh, better law enforcement to remove the legal debts. And another one will be a bottom-up approach, trying to add value to this uh, traditional fishers and adding incentives for the net, net casting fishers to keep interacting with dolphins, uh, even if the fish declines, um, for example, by putting premium prices to keep the fishers cooperating with dolphins, regardless of how much they catch. However, our model suggests that none of these actions alone is enough. Uh, so we predict that, but it predicts that when combining these two top-down or bottom-up uh, actions into a more integrated conservation program, that's when we can mirror that best case scenario of the dolphin population remaining stable. I wanna make a note here that our model is necessarily uh, flawed. So it oversimplifies the problem. Uh, enforcing the law, yes, will help. Incentivizing the fishers will help too. But uh, such you know, bottom-up and top-down approaches, uh, they're well-intentioned, but they overlook uh, the fact that the, the fishers also engage in other activities than illegal drift nets. And that dolphins also die from natural causes, uh, from contamination, and not only from bycatch, but it provides us uh, uh, an idea of how you know combining these initial steps, top-down and, and bottom-up approaches, can help us uh, manage the system. And safeguarding this social ecological systems uh, with human wildlife cooperation can be really difficult, uh, or add more challenges to to. Um, a, a, to the conservation of the biological components alone. And this is because to keep this alive, we need uh, not only the biological components, so a healthy population of uh, dolphins, a healthy population of humans, and a suitable environment in, in the prey as well. We, we also need to preserve that compatible interspecific knowledge, how you know, we need individuals that know how to interact with the dolphins, and we need individual dolphins that are skilled enough to uh, understand how the interaction with humans uh, happen as well. So we can preserve that behavioral synchrony that is key for their interaction uh, to be uh, successful. Um, so meanwhile, there's some good news here. We've been seeing this combining, uh, combined um, strategies gain momentum. So there's a uh, bottom-up uh, approach. So it's uh, there's been recent advances in the legal protection, not only of the dolphin population, but also of the interaction itself as a cultural heritage. So to me, it's very inspiring to see that the local people there in Laguna, they understand the value of zooming in and looking to uh, the value of conserving this few components few biological and cultural components for the greater good of the whole system. And so our data suggests that acting early can prevent the Laguna dolphins to be caught in the same trap of negative fishing interactions. They're taking away other small dolphins uh, around the world, for example, the vaquita. Now in Laguna, there are only 60 individuals of a new subspecies that is endemic to a small portion of South America. And disturbing this dolphin fisher cooperation would threaten not only this small pocket of genetic diversity, but also a small pocket of cultural diversity. The fact that this human animal interaction has been around for over a century, it means really two things. First, that there's a behavior specialization that has outlived individual dolphins and individual fishers, has been passed down to generations of both species, not genetically, but by a learning. So it's part of the cultures of humans and if you will, of dolphins too. But the second is being around for that long does not guarantee that we'll continue in the next year. And in fact, it's kind of impressive that it's still alive given that so much things could go wrong. There has been more and more understanding that culture matters not only for humans, but also for animals too. And uh, they, 
they might exist in animal populations like in dolphins in their key traits to be conserved for the greater good of preserving biodiversity. So just like biological diversity at the start, uh, I want to say that cultural diversity is everywhere, but they are specific to each place. And we can all agree that diversity in general is a good uh, thing to, to try and promote and preserve. And to close on a more personal note, uh, I want to mention that uh, these specific interaction, this specific culture, uh, I think is important in days like today, we're faced with so many bad news. Uh, it reminds us uh, of a simple lesson that by cooperating, we can perhaps all coexist in harmony. So with that, I would like to, to uh, thank the support of my own large team of cooperators without whom none of this work would be possible. And this is a truly a collaboration among researchers working in the area for the past three decades, lots of graduate students and uh, more recently researchers like me. And throughout all of this, this time, we've been working directly with the local officials. So thank you for your time and I'll take any questions. 